Hello and welcome to the Ratness Podcast, episode number 12 with Terry Miller. Woo! What's up, dude? Thank you so much again for being on the show and helping us out. Um, Terry is a creative director, producer, writer, post-production director. You've done it all. You've started from a grip and now you're here. Uh, <laughs> how did it work when you were younger and, and you were saying people were telling you you got to do stuff? a certain way or there's a certain hierarchy of this like what got you into to the scene and then what got you moved along in it well i mean i guess first and foremost i did i did graduate from college i went to school for marketing um business management and was interested in the advertising side of it um and got into news and started getting into it after a couple of years of experience of camera work and editing, I moved from where I was at the time, which was Montgomery, Alabama, um, where I was a camera operator for a show like Cops. It was called County Law. Yeah. So it was a 20-month uh, adrenaline rush. I can imagine, <laughs> uh, bro. Doing what was the wildest warrants, thing you ever saw on that? No dude. knock warrants. Um, we were in several high speed chases that ended uh, one of them ended badly in an accident, but we were okay. But it was just like I said, it was that was my first two years in the industry. Um, oh man, and um, so, so you, you I dove in head first, quick. yeah, you dove in head first, pretty much. I was, I had zero opportunity walking into the job, and they liked the way I interviewed, they liked my passion for learning and just trying to figure it out what I wanted to do. So they gave me a chance. I mean, I had zero experience and I was going to Higgins guys with three to five years of videography experience in the news gathering agency. So um, just being enthusiastic was probably uh, the thing that got me my first opportunity, that and a friendship, you know. Um, but then once I started getting into it and I moved back home to Southern California um, and I wanted to break into Hollywood and start doing all those things. And, um, you know, and I started out as like, a, it's called, I don't know, it's, it's, it's more on the film side. It's a video assist where they have a video tap on the 35 millimeter camera. And then you're basically providing monitors for the directors and the agencies of you know, high, like super high end commercials and, um, you know, movie production and stuff like that. And, you know, and you, you talk back and forth on set and that was, I had an opportunity to be there, but I wasn't a union guy. I mean, I was being kind of graduated into it, but you know, the mentality was you're, you're a grip, you're a camera operator, you're in camera department, you're, in our department till you work into something else. And, and that for the most part is, is how, you know, the industry is, I mean, you, you get in and you choose one thing mm -hmm. and you go for it. You know, uh, for me, it was about learning about the process because it wasn't about just going and being a union camera guy or being a union, whatever. It was about going and learning from the best people in the industry. Um, what I didn't know and what I wanted to learn. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, the mentality was, is, you know, I was a camera cinematographer at the time and, you know, and they said, Oh, you, you need to be a camera operator because I was doing more editing than I was doing camera operating. And I found in the process of learning, you know, becoming a better, better editor made me a better shooter. And so on and so forth that kind of created this cycle of where where a lot of people in the industry they're like okay you're a music video director i had an opportunity to be mentored by mtv director marty thomas and so you know he he fought that for almost his entire career he wanted to make movies but he was the mtv guy yeah he was the music <laughs> video guy so you get put the industry wants to put you into a box. Yeah, right. right. Um, so it, it helps better sell you, promote you, so on and so forth. That's just there's a formula to a it. in the engine, so to speak. If I remember, so if I remember, I, me, interrupt, but I got a lot of experience from him, not only as a producer, 
he gave me one of my first opportunities to be DP uh, music video. Um, I got my first opportunity to direct a music video or edit a music video. Uh, my first Disney project, my first MTV project, my first BET project, everything was just because this guy gave me a chance. Yeah, you know? that's awesome. So, um, so a lot of it is, is, is just, just heart and desire. Are you willing to, to do the work others aren't? And that's, that's kind of what I do. That's what I've always tried to do. Um, I, I've done music videos, but I do a lot of industrial stuff. I do um, a lot of documentary stuff, but we do commercial stuff. So it's, I try and understand current trends and where they're going and how they apply to each form of media. And, and then as, as the media has changed and it's changed dramatically uh -huh. uh, since I got in the industry, I was on a standard deaf uh, four by three, seven twenty p camera when I started, and now you can shoot in two hundred k if you want to yeah, yeah. array a bunch of reds together, you know, and be stupid, um, you know. But um, you know, so it's the media has changed quite a bit, and so does the audience, and I think that's been the fun part is of the creative process is seeing where things have been. And, and kind of trying to apply on where they're going to go, uh -huh. you know, and I've, I've been around long enough to see that we're, but we were back in the eighties for a little bit. And now we're cycling through the nineties theme wise and a lot of different stuff. So it's, it's just a matter of trying to identify and figure out those trends. And then how, how do you exploit that? You know, as someone that's worked in the industry and seen it change for years or seen it change over years, I should say, is there something that gets you excited to see like happening now that like the trends are like coming back around? Yeah. I think what is interesting uh, for me is this, the whole unreal engine application the, of virtual production Yeah, uh, yeah. where they're, they're marrying the video game technology um and mocap type production to yeah. create um some really super cool stuff and that probably would have never gotten pushed to the forefront of importance had it not been for covid yeah. um and being locked away and and being forced to learn how to create in a different environment than what you're used to and it was fortunate because there's a few of us I've been following it. This is stuff that's been going on since like Avatar, you know, uh, when yeah. James Cameron made yeah. Avatar, it, he was essentially for the first time, instead of shooting them in a green screen environment, they were able to actually see the feedback and the previews and the monitors. So they weren't looking at their reactions and stuff against a green screen. They were actually looking at in a pre-rendered model. Right, of what the scene was gonna look of like. Of what the scene was. Yeah. And then it gave them better feedback of how to interact with that environment. And, um, and that's kind of where it's kind of generationally started there and now, now it's, it's prevalent. And, yeah. and COVID is kind of what the catalyst was there that created that. Have you worked on projects that uh, shoot like in strictly VR kind of uh, format like that? No, no. I mean, we've been testing it um, for, I mean, in theory, for several years. Um, but the issue, the issue, it really is, <clears throat> excuse me, the issue really is um, the, the video wall technology and it catching up with the camera's ability to shoot it. Gotcha. So... Um, whereas the video walls were pr primarily just applicable in like a jumbotron or, you know, huge concert setting, um, they have in the past, like with movies, like with gravity, um, I've actually worked with the projection, the projectionists of that movie. And that was all projector and screens, Interesting. you know, when you watch that movie. So they've been testing and working with this virtual type of you know reality counterculture to the 3d visual effects stuff for some time so i think in that 
year and in places like California where they're continue to be kind of in an environment where they're, they're just going to have to innovate to be able to keep going. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a market obviously for both there's the technology and everything moving forward that has that stream and there's a kind of specific things that you can accomplish with that. And there's also a very still warm feel to the physical props and, and just, not so digitally imposed or CGI type of filmmaking, um, whether that be landscapes or old cars or whatever it is, but there's some feel to that that it, it makes it kind of movie magic. Um, I don't know if one's going to fade away because the other one gets more popular, but it, it's something you could think about, you know? I, you know, I think the traditional form of filmmaking is never in 100 years, in spite of anything, ever going to go away. I think I think it depends on the layers of, you know, corporate control, studio control, union control, you know, independent producers, we have a little bit more leeway. Um, but again, that limits us to how we can work and who we can work with. So there's some give and take too, if you want to work with, you know, a SAG actor, you know, um, then you've got to abide by SAG laws and SAG rules. Mm-hmm. So you just, I think primarily you just have to be able to adapt uh, to whatever that environment is. Georgia is in a unique position because out of LA and New York, we're the only one that's pretty much open. So but there's more sound stages being built and ground being broken on new sound stages. I mean, that, Georgia's been billion, a- billions of dollars of infrastructure that's being put in. Yeah. So, you know, ideally, you know, probably in the next couple of years, George is going to take over that number one film and television. Yeah. Stuff. Just going to say, they, what they're they've been laying the groundwork for, for years now, kind of um, with a few major studios, but might be secondary names to, to people that aren't familiar with. But I mean, tons of stuff has been produced out of Georgia. Um, it's kind of like the second hub for film in the United States right now. And like you were saying, uh, with the development and them kind of having more lax laws and being open to production, uh, it could very well be number one in the next few years here. Yeah, I think I think the the you know that you, you still have to abide by the COVID guidelines, you still have to abide by all that stay stuff. But um you know, I think just in the fact of being being able to be out and about, you know, um, and secure a location and to have a film permitting process that's open um, and to have insurance to be able to work with you. You know, I mean, those are all important things. So um, from a purely economical, um, logistical jumping off point, you know, we're in a good position. Absolutely. Um, and it's not just the major studios. Warner Brothers just, I mean, bought a ridiculous amount of acreage to convert to backlot and uh, sound stages. So, um, and so it's 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 the and Atlanta itself is probably one of the largest independent production outlets in in the world. Right. Um, as far as at least at easily the United States. Um, because there's the amount of film festivals here is like, I, I thought LA had a, a lot of film festivals or California had a lot of film festivals, but, um, here in, here in Atlanta and in Georgia, I mean, there's a ton of them, like, <laughs> and it's hard well, to that's keep awesome up with for them. opportunity. So yeah. it's, and it's just something that's going to continue to grow. So definitely when, when, you know, when I work with Jim and, he was a producer on MX Yoga. Thanks for rapping. Uh, um, you know, um, just getting out of California was a major goal for me for a long time, as you know, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember so, when you made the move. And, and bro, I have to give you props. I got to give you a pat on the back. You called it so proper. You were like, hey, the, the Georgia, Atlanta area is going to be the next place. It really hadn't boomed yet. And you, no, you we got were, out we there. were in the first wave out. You were, we man. were in the first wave out. Um, so really able to capitalize on that gold rush out there uh, from California. And, and that really brought some clout. If I remember what you were saying, like you came from Hollywood, you were out there. People were looking for that guy. 
Um, it's been helpful to open the door, but obviously it's it's especially important about relationships and building yeah. relationships. Uh, I mean, your credits and, and all that only go so far. I mean, I got so much crap about my IMD page and I, I kind of laugh at people because it's like kind of a joke to me. Um, yeah. When I came up in the early 2000s, IMDB was kind of a joke, you know? So the only IMDB stuff I have is all stuff other people put up in my name. Um, <laughs> so it's not even something I even like, and most of the people, a lot of people I know that are, you know, uh, post-production supervisors and top producers and PGA guys say, ah, don't worry about IMDB. But here they're so, they're uh, very impressed by the IMDB. Mm -hmm. And, Had to and go that's update. fine. I mean, really, IMDB, all you need is a website um, and you're a director. Yeah. You know? and, and, the, and you know Photoshop. And here's the thing about IMDB. I was called in, uh, it was my, actually my accident <clears throat> that about killed me. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. <laughs> Stupid. Anyway. Um, I didn't think I so. I, 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 I loved what you were doing. Just blanked out. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I saying? Oh, I think that was a perfect transition. Let's talk about your accident, bro. Well, first off, hold up. Can we rewind? Because we mentioned MX Yoga, but we didn't say anything about it. Jim was a producer on a project that you did where you never had ridden motocross in your life, and you decided Pretty to much. start riding motocross, right? Pretty much. I mean, <laughs> uh, not just ride motocross. He decided to compete, race yeah. and make it on a professional level. Well, no, it didn't start out that way because I didn't even know if I was going to make it to the first gate. That's right. Um, that's right. You had to practice first. So, so the storyline kind of progressed over time. But um, to back it up, uh, I think it was 2006. It was before I met my wife. Um, I rode street bikes. And like uh, most street bike riders in California in the 909, yeah, yeah, represent. are a little bit nuts when it comes to two wheels. Split so, lanes and all. Um, I was fortunate to live through what I did, but I ultimately um, did a header on I-10 in Palm Springs at 85 miles an hour Ooh, after me. a hate truck dropped about a third of his truck, uh, a truckload of hay bales across three lanes of freeway. And I think there was about a 60 mile headwind going through the desert. Um, so visibility was maybe, um, maybe a hundred, 100, 200 feet. And so I, um, I had just gone onto the freeway, clicked it up into fifth. I was going 85 miles an hour some hay flacked me in the helmet and I closed my eyes. And when I opened them, all I saw was hay bales. In front oh, of me. God. So I went over the handlebars at, I was 85, 90, um, hit a hay bale. That's what saved my life. Um, I was the first of, uh, what's that? That's crazy. That's yeah. just, that's nuts. Uh, uh, it was Valentine's Day. Um, it was my Valentine's Day massacre. There was 14, 14 vehicles, three bikes. I was the first uh, to go through. Um, I think when I opened my eyes and saw the hay bales, I pretty much, I had about, I don't know. I, I had no time to scream or vocalize or do anything. It yeah, was no just, reaction time. God, get me through this. That's how I remember that. I'll never forget that. And I went over, I remained conscious. Had I not remained conscious, um, well, I'll get to that. Mm -hmm. But I, I hit the hay bale. I hit the hay bale with such impact. I was wearing a Kevlar jacket, racing jacket. That's probably what saved my life. Uh, I hit the hay, uh, hay bale so hard that it broke the steel lining and exploded. So. My, my helmet shot off my head like a cork from a champagne bottle um, and shot across the road. Um, I came to and I realized I'm alive. I'm in the middle of the freeway. 
And so I broke for the shoulder. As I broke for the shoulder, that's when the next car behind me came through. And I literally, um, it was like slow motion, super, super slow motion. But I literally had to jump the front fender uh, of the vehicle to get off to onto the shoulder to keep from getting hit from that car, who in all likelihood probably never even saw me until I was in their peripheral passing them, you know? Wow. So, um, so that was pretty much the start of my two world journey. And that seems like the end of it pretty quick. Um, got married. I met my wife six months later. Um, so wait, 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 what injuries you broke your wrist and everything in that yeah. accident, right? Oh, like okay. what oh, yeah, was your yeah, injuries? Yeah. yeah. That's when I became bionic. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I basically shattered these two bones, both bones. So there's plates. You can see the, there's a big ass scar. Yeah. Oh, I see it. That's from 2006. And then the entrance here. So still, still plates on both both uh bones um uh, uh multiple screws um you know i was done with that type of stuff right um i was more concerned about losing my be ability to be a camera operator so yeah with the wrist that kind of pushed me yeah. down the path of being a director of photography and everything else because all i wanted to do at that point was be able to still operate a camera um, and then I got married. Um, her family is into desert racing and bringing the kids up and, and through all that. I mean, for many years, I couldn't get near a bike. I couldn't approach a bike without um, shortness of breath. Yeah. I mean, it was literally causing PTSD, yeah. uh, shaking. Um, I was scared to death. but. But for the point of kind of bringing the kids up into that two world lifestyle and dirt racing and and all that, it was one of those like I, I just wanted to face that fear, throw my leg over the bike. Yeah, Papa Terry's got to step up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like I need to I need to do this, and I think I used at the time my ability. <clears throat> You know my doc, my status as a documentary filmmaker at the time, to go out and kind of use it as a roadmap to, I mean, go out and get some sponsors. Um, you know, I mean, within like six months of doing this project, we had, you know, several sponsors. And I hadn't half even a dozen, done a yeah. race yet. It was just simply from the web series. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm 38 years old. I'm a former adrenaline junkie going through a midlife crisis. <laughs> and so I'm going to learn how to race motocross. Yeah. And so, go ahead. You look like you're going to ask a question. I was going to say, so that was, that was it though, that just you uh, taking the kids out and like family and stuff that reignited that, that uh, like, I can do this. I can get back on a bike and, and then the, the idea for doing the documentary series came after you actually started getting back on one. Well, I think, I think where it came from was, is I had a drone company yeah. um, and I had the opportunity to work with Josh Grant, uh, number 33. 33. Uh, and um, we did some drone footage for him and we were doing super slow-mo footage. And uh, in the process of editing the project and being able to slow the footage down, as a college baseball player, I played baseball for 20 something years. We use video feedback all the time. So I kind of used Josh Grant as a model to like, how do you sit on a bike? You know, little, little stupid technical things that I just from visual observation can kind of give you a head start. Totally. Um, if and then slowly just started gauging my own writing progression in the process. And it turned into like a vlog. And, you know, Jim was there for, I think uh, I joined on what, like day, three years of it. Yeah. I think I joined uh, on, I don't know what day it was day 30 or day something of your practice before you had done your first race. That's though. right. And I, uh, I, we had That's talked right. about it and we had sat down and kind of talked with it and, 
I started going out and running the camera. I never touched a camera before. You gave me an opportunity to do that. We ran all the green screen audio, man. That green screen room that we built in your garage was a lot of fun. <laughs> many, many hours in that night, man. That's super tight. And uh, yeah, that was a really, really fun experience, dude. It really was. And you gave me a lot of opportunity to, to learn and, and to figure out what it means to be a producer truly and to actually be hands on in a in a creative mindset you know and and be right there working right. with you 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 really allowed me to take that and and feel like it was my own and right along with you and dude we created something great i a lot of people don't know it's there go check it out mx yoga but it, it, it was a lot of fun have the, the highest subscriber but i to be fair i kind of gave up with youtube i got pissed off at youtube i was like <laughs> can i cuss yeah yeah go ahead Fuck you, YouTube. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. I got to that point to where I was like, fuck YouTube. At that point, Facebook was starting to get bigger. So we started putting stuff onto there. Um, I mean, we did. I pushed that rope uphill for um, a long time. Long time, man. You, bear, you bore a burden with that one for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I had an opportunity to work with uh, a film producer, you know, um, he's done so, quite a bit of stuff. I'm not going to name drop, but, <laughs> um, he, he did, he, he took a look at everything. He was basically the one that said, you need to make it an underdog story. Um, so that's where 500 days an underdog story came from. So we remodeled it. We came that close to getting a presentation sponsor with a CBD. Um, I mean, come on, a dude <laughs> in his forties trying to race motocross. I mean, of course it perfect is candidate for CBD healing. <laughs> Come on. There's like only about 3 million of us out there trying to do this shit. You yeah. Know? So no, man, I feel uh, like if we hit a wall, every, everything that we tried, nothing broke in our direction as we, as we ran it. But d despite all of that, bro, it, how many days of riding did you get in before you got injured? It was like three hundred day three hundred or something. I'm on I'm on day three seventeen. Um, the accident was day two eighty six, but that was the major accident. The first one was the collarbone. First one was collarbone, that, right? That was day one eighty six. Yeah, but that only took so you I'm down gonna, for like four weeks, I'm bro. Stay you clear were back day three eighty six. We may be doing jump rope that day. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, uh, the first one was. Day 186. Um, so, yeah, okay, so let's back this up because what, the whole first season was not even knowing whether or not I was ever going to get to a race. Right. And then we got to a point where I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And it was day 57. You can go onto YouTube. It's MX Yoga Series channel on YouTube. Um, it's pretty easy to find. Um, there's also a Mexican yoga that tried to yeah, steal. Uh, yeah, they tried. <laughs> we, we actually recorded that, but never used it. <laughs> that, that's that skit with um, Brat Bigley. Brat Bigley, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh man, rest in peace, Brat Bigley. So we we created my alter ego, character. and his name's Brat Bigley. But that was a good um, character. It was like a like a Hunter S. Thompson, like fear and loathing type vibe, you know? Hell yeah. But anyways, we get to the first race, the gate drops. My very first race, I throw down a whole shot. Jumped out in front which, of everyone. This for, is the for those first, of you that first person to the first corner, right? That's like what everybody, whoa! That's what makes the panty drops, right? Yeah. So right out the my first gate, first race, whole shot. What happened the very next turn, Jim? Crash! <laughs> Like not even, not even like a, like a. Oh, we're real bad. Terry just took the turn and fell down. Like, like, like the squid that I am. He got overexcited. Yeah. He he spun his fucking throttle Dude. like the whole shot. Oh my god, I'm gonna take this Hell and yeah. just wheeled out. Wing. That's so funny. Um, and then um, yeah, yeah. 
Well, was it the guy? The guy took me out in the turn. He ran me up into the bank. That's what you like to say about that first was, turn, bro. That's what. You, that's your story. The video doesn't lie. <laughs> okay. So, so wait, the, there was, was you're thinking of Moto Two. Moto Two <laughs> is when I just right. fell over. I hit the ground so hard. You might be my right. My GoPro came off. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it would. That's the one I'm thinking of. He literally like toppled in a turn and just hit the ground. Still on the bike, just fell over so hard the GoPro burst off of his helmet. Dude, if you had to guess in this whole project, how many times did you hit the ground? Like, oh, it had to have been a ton, right? For 500 days of riding. Um, like I said, I think I'm on 315. I haven't touched the ground since 286. Nice. Hey, but um, at the beginning, there were days when he would get off of a practice round and he would go five or six laps for practice and like, all right, bro, you didn't fall once. Good oh, yeah. job. <laughs> like you made it around five laps. You didn't fall. Those were the early days. Early like, days, yes. man. Those were good days. The little things. I None. mean, it was, it was silly stuff. It was silly stuff. And, um, um, like I think one, I like came out like a bull and blew everybody out, whole shot. I mean, I was like four seconds, five seconds ahead of everybody in the first lap, halfway through the lap. And I go to make the turn at the top of the mountain and just stall out. Yep. <laughs> and boom, 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 fall all the way down the hill. It was, um, it was frightening for us all the way <laughs> watching him tumble down this like 400 yard or 40 yard hill, like all the way down at a 40 degree angle. He, uh, it, yeah, it was frightening yeah. for sure. Dude, for someone that's lived through that first crash and has a bionic arm and then any spill, I would just be like, oh, I'm going to die. Like, this is the end. Like, I don't know how, you, how you could take it with stride and like, keep going, dude. I'd be I like, I'm I over it. I want well, to take what you think when you get started. Um, there's a lot of forgiveness in dirt, you know, yeah. as comparison to the asphalt. Absolutely. Um, and 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 sometimes you get hurt less the faster you're going. So because you skim across the top of it rather than plant into it. Right. Right. So I think I think uh, the couple years I had learning karate. Um, in Aikido, I learned how to fall. So that was number one, you need to learn how to fall. Um, and, you know, I think when I first started out, I, I was at the same mindset that you just said was, you know, you just fear hitting the ground. Um, but then as I started getting instruction with things, you know, from people and different, I called them Reiki masters um, uh, because it was MX Yoda and, these guys were all professional level or semi-professional level people that were kind of guiding me along the way. So I didn't kill myself. Um, and they, they did, they saved his life a couple times. <laughs> Cause I mean, it wasn't like I was just suiting up, throwing my leg over and just doing it. No, you were but doing like, the homework, okay, like man. The first 25 days, it was like that. And then I almost landed on a dude on like day 29. Um, <laughs> And I was like, okay, I probably need to get some instruction here. Um, yeah. And um, so, you know, I learned through, I had some training. I had, they trained me. They helped me. Um, they helped me make sure that I was, you know, how I knew how to launch out of the gate, you know, because you go to YouTube and go look at uh, gate launch, uh, uh, gate start fails. And holy crap. Oh, there's a lot of them. I mean, you're going to have fun with that. Yeah. Because yeah. it's just, wah, 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 wah. You know, it's just chaos, total chaos. And for, and especially the videos for the first time starting, uh, you know, and they grab too much throttle and they're whiskey, whiskey throttling. And it's just, I desensitized myself to all that type of stuff before I ever got on the bike. Yeah. You know? Yo, so I know you said there was some projects that you're working on that you can't talk about right now, but is there some projects you're working on that you can talk about right now? Well, I mean, we are, have already started talking about it. Um, and, you know, 500 Days is on Amazon Prime. It's been in stall pattern for a minute. 
but uh, we're about to have three episodes up there. Yes, sir. Um, and then I'm, I'm in the process because of another project. It's just a workload thing. Mm-hmm. But once I get six episodes, I'm going to Netflix with it and Roku and all that other stuff. But we'll be dropping six episodes at once. Um, I, think, I think that's the best way to watch it from the feedback that we've gotten. Binge, um, it's binge worthy for sure. To just be able to watch and go from, because it's kind of set up for you to go from, I think, uh, day 139 or something is where uh, 500 Days starts off, which is I've done the unthinkable and qualified for Road to Mammoth in my, my first year. Oh, Rookie yeah, season, yeah. Um, yeah. Dude, it's good. I, I, I watch the ones that are up. I, you, uh, you know, when they came out a little earlier, uh, this year, last be the end of it's last been, year. Yeah, right before COVID, yeah. we were putting them up heavy. That's what's up, dude. It's really good. We had so much fun making that. We got to travel up to Sacramento. We travel to Barstow. We travel to all the different uh, motocross yeah. racetracks around the the California. And you went even out of the state to do a couple of races that I couldn't join on. But that, that's got to be a fun yeah. project, dude. Yeah. Like working all over with the homies. Um, it, well, it was definitely fun. It made the road trips a lot more fun because for a lot of it, I was doing it on my own. Um, so that's in the back of your head too. Like when you're doing these races for, as an old guy is you need to be able to save enough energy to load the bike back up onto the truck. <laughs> right. the well, there'd be days so, I would show so up and, it was- Jim and everybody else yeah. started joining. It was like, okay, I can go. 10% farther. Yeah, exactly. You know? He would say that, like, <laughs> I can go a little harder because you're here. Last time I had nobody with me you had to yeah. load the bike. But I remember saying at the beginning when I, I came in just to really do audio and kind of on the production green screen side, of like the post stuff. But I started going to the races and you're like, dude, if you're going to be here, yep. you're working a camera. If, <laughs> if you're going to be here, we need the footage. And yep. I remember you're there selling... You know. Your selling feature was like, at the very least, we need it on camera if I go down. <laughs> like, all, all right, man. Right. Here we go. I right. I need it. I need it for posterity. Yeah. And you know, every major accident, I've had a camera rolling on it. So. Yep. <laughs> but no, that was it. Was a lot of fun, man. <laughs> so and there's that. I know. I know as well, well as I did. The thing about MX Yoga was a completely different type of storytelling, because it was the very first time that I put myself in front of the camera. I've never been in front of the camera. Um, my job was behind the camera, right? Telling people how to be having no idea how to do it myself. So I put myself into that. And then once we brought Ian, uh, into the production of it, um, yeah, Ian, and dude, his know, whole, him and his crew out great. With all that other stuff. It was like, I was able to turn off my brain as a director and just put myself through the process. So at every level, you know, from uh, season one to season two, which is up on YouTube from MX Yoga, you can really, I mean, oh, yeah. there's probably about three hours of content and you'll get to see about two years of progression um, that has been very humbling to get other people's feedback um, on, especially people who, I mean, I'm racing against people who've been doing it for 30 years. Right. Um, and I'm doing it. I'm in my take away my accident. I've only had four years of seat time. But, you know, I'm well, six years into the process now with two years down on a near fatal accident. And not not only are you up against these guys, but these guys are like you're able to run with them and you're impressing them. Like I remember so often when we were running this regular, the comments on the YouTube or the emails that you would get were guys that had been racing for 30 years and they were in their forties or fifties and hadn't raced or ridden, a, ridden in 10. And they're like, you know what? I went out and bought a bike because of you, or, you know what? I'm hopping back on and I went out and raced yeah. just because, and I got my son with me doing it. Like, you weren't just up against the guys that were doing it for 30 years. You were inspiring the guys that had been doing it 30 years and kind of fallen off and forgotten about it, you know, that, and that's what really drew me to the project yeah, I think- is just the way you were, you were able to say, you know what, I'm putting my life on the line or I'm putting my ass on the line on this seat so that you can feel good about it. And you did, man, there well, was dozens of guys. 
Yeah, I kind of gave uh, gave old guys someone to root for, you know. Yeah, you do. I, I mean, coming out the gate, I mean, you remember the first episode? The comments were like, "Go pick up bowling." Yeah, you you're know? not gonna do it, it but stupid. you're gonna kill yourself. <laughs> and you know what? By the grace of God, I didn't. But you tried. I tried. <laughs> I damn near tried for a full solid eighteen months. It wasn't nothing about technique. It was just about Go, go, it, go. doing this yep. and trying to hold the, the fuck on yep. you know <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Um, and and the balls just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger but i wasn't getting smarter and i think that's that's where the collarbone came in and i was like if i'm gonna do this i need a legit trainer mm -hmm. i need to learn how to ride safely yeah. Um, well, and that's what you needed. Ride with some technique. That's when I started riding with Mike Chastain. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's and that's what you needed. You needed to be able to focus on your riding and become. You had reached the point of being able to direct and produce uh, the the web series and also be a full time writer. You had to focus well, on writing for your own safety at that point. Pretty and much, and it, it was what we discovered, and we had several conversations about this was. The second I let go of mm -hmm. that that purpose, the story just started writing itself. It I did. You know, um, so it became very interesting. I mean, from the hitting wall after wall after wall after wall, falling, 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 falling but always getting up. Mm -hmm. And then I finally break through and have my first win, you know, and it was just like, well now you got a wall full no, of plaques and it, and it was like within a year yeah. and you know i never even knew when i started that i was ever even going to get to a race much less win an entire series that trans world series as a beginner i won i was five and oh yeah won every, so impressive. every round so impressive <laughs> For and um it, but again i it was with all that help that we got there and you know and then the hard part about that sport is as much as you examine and analyze everything you still have to face your fear uh -huh. you still have to get up i mean when i hit that jump out at uh lacr uh -huh. Um, it's a blind jump. It's like a 45 degree face with a 250 foot run. You're hitting this uh, probably mid, a top of third, bottom of fourth. You don't know where you're going. You can't see where you're going. Um, and you have to make it far enough that you don't land up. It's a step up. So if you don't go far enough. I'm just going to clip it and. You're going oh, head yeah. first into a wall. Jeez. And I mean, and it's, it was, it was one of those where it was like, okay, I finally hit an official jump because it was like a three and a half, four second hang time, which <laughs> that's pretty wild. When dude. you're on the bike, that's, that's like, scary. that's a commercial, Come you know, it's like coming oh, from like 30 seconds. You're like, woo, taking everything in. And it's like, I got landed still. Dude, tell so, me, like skateboarding when I was a kid, three or four seconds in the air, that's that's way too many stairs. Like, no, <laughs> you, you shouldn't be jumping down that if you're in the air for four seconds. That shit is crazy. I think that that jump hucks you up about 25 feet. Yeah, it was a killer um, jump. At, at the apex when you're coming down, which is leads to... Stupid act of stupidity number two, um, which I went through the first uh, series of mammoths. I finished fourth. Just off the Was podium. Yeah, yeah, I finished yeah. fourth. Look, I started the series. They said, you won't qualify. I qualified. So I decided, well, since I qualified, ah, let's, it. let's go going. for it. Yeah, why not? And then I, we went to, um, Turlock, mm -hmm. and I took third. Yep, gave him automatic and position so all of a in sudden, I'm like, hmm, I'm like seventh in the series now, and so that just kept me driving and driving and driving. At one point, I was four points out of 
first. Yeah, after and, the in guy, town. and the guy that was in first had it was sandbagging. He had been in first three years in a row. He should have been riding in a different class, but he dropped down and just took first from everyone. Isn't that right? I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. I know, oh, I know, you're just saving face. It's all right. I'll that, take the I, blame I for that one. Someone else. All right. I might be no, thinking. But, no, Tim was someone that was getting someone back in it, but he was someone who had 3X, 4X seat time yeah. as far as years riding. So wait, what was uh, the second? All right. Sorry, Tim. Mistake? Sorry, Tim. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> no, what, did you crash again? Or what? That was the awesome thing about that series because at that point I was so ignorant of the actual pain um, or the potential of the pain that, hey, the faster you were, the more I liked you because I was going to try and keep up with you. Yeah, that's and, right. And um, so I, it made me faster. Uh, the faster they were, faster it made me um uh, so that was it was all good it was a great experience to be able to go from good luck good luck qualifying to you to, know to keep at it one up point, with the, the guys yeah, yeah. first well, I, I finished in the top five we got the gate pick um so i did make the top five in my rookie season and then um and then the next year with road to loretta um, qualified for the regional championships. Yeah. So, it, with with my with people like Mike, um, and all the different Reiki masters, Terry Pierce, who was my race tech. Yeah, that um, guy saved your life Dave, just checking Dave, your bike. Uh, Dave Sequist, who's a professional downhill guy, was the OG Reiki. Yeah. Sorry, my voice is going out. It's all right. You spend all day yelling at everybody. Can we take and it, a minute it's... so I can get something to drink. Yeah, go ahead, man. Do your thing. Okay. Yeah. Dude, I've I've seen Terry on set before, and and it's just everyone's got to get yelled at. There's never there's <laughs> never a time where, and it's not yelling out of anger, but it's so loud and there's so much going on that you have you're ten yell. feet away. You have to yell at someone. So when I when I he signed on and I heard his voice a little raspy, I was like, oh, he's been working. <laughs> Real quick while he's gone, and we'll probably edit all this out. So you should all go check out MX Yoga. Definitely. It's a great, a great show. It's on Amazon. You can watch the first couple episodes. You heard it from the mouth of the director. There might be uh some some more episodes dropping in the near future. I don't know. You might want to binge watch them. I don't know, but you should definitely be going and checking those things out. And get get absent certs, bro. Dude, we get an absent cert. Get an absent cert. I could go for some scallops right about now. There we go. Yeah, buddy. Oh, nice. A little Lagunitas. Well, let's jump into what you've it been. Came back. Let's jump into what you've been doing lately with La La Land uh, Enterprises and kind of how how things have worked out. We just went through MX Yoga. Uh, we touched on the fact that you were doing that. Uh, there you go. We got the shirt going. We we touched on the fact that you were doing the drone flights for a while, and I'm I'm sure kind of everything led up to what you're doing over there right now. Um, I, what what's La La Land Inter Enterprises all, all about? Um, well, as La La Land is kind of my happy place, it's La La Land is, um, you know, that's movie land, you know, um, enterprises is the ability to make it a business. So, um, it, we're basically taking and assist from writing a script, helping you come up with the idea all the way through shooting. Um, all the way through editing and delivery to the network or studio. Okay. Um, so from beginning writing to post everything, it's start to finish. You can, you consult or uh, consult and uh, assist um, produce for people. Correct. Um, I, I do the various projects. I'm just on a consultant basis. Um, there's others that I'm the post-production supervisor and I'm actually managing the media and delivering the, you know, commercial entities. Um, and then there's several corporations, Fortune 500 corporations, that's kind of been the bread and butter over the years. 
um, is when we kind of started taking the idea of conceptual broadcast movie making and started making corporate ideas and making corporate messaging with that. And, um, you know, that's kind of a big part of, of what we do as far as, you know, keeping us going and, and sure. giving us the ability to go out and do our fun things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Got to keep the lights but, on. And and nowadays you can't be in business without some type of, of content. So um, wh- whether we ever shoot a camera or, or shoot anything, you know, sometimes we're just consulting them on, on, you know, social media stuff and sure, yeah. how to create the message for what the end game is, what they're trying to get to. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the videos, as you've noticed, um, I know Jim is kind of taking a break from social media, but it when, when, when a trend hits, it seems like within a matter of a, a few weeks, everything looks and feels the same. Yeah. Um, so, and the tactics and the, the type of commands and, Right now in, in my profession, there's so many people selling tutorial master classes. <laughs> it's silly. Um, there is no shortcut, people. There is no shortcut. You are not going to learn everything you know to get hundred thousand dollar clients in two weeks of three payments of ninety nine ninety nine. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. They got Martin Scorsese teaching these like master classes. Like people are going to watch those Scorsese are, those talk. Those are once. absolutely worth. It. I, I have those <laughs> and just be like, all I right, think, I'm Scorsese. I think, now. I think with filmmaking, it took me about eh, fifteen years to figure out. I'm solving problems, like I'm trying to tell a story, and inherently in a real world, in reality you're going to face problems. Um, Whether it's the neighbor who decides he needs to mow his yard at 9 9 p.m. at night while you're trying to record your podcast or, you know, shoot your scene. Um, You know, there's just, you have to be able to apply knowledge and experience. And the best way, without having the experience of actually going and failing forward and making the mistakes yourself and learning from those mistakes and applying what you learn to the next round and so on and so forth, rinse and repeat. Um, you know, and I think that's what's wrong with today. I'm getting off on a tangent, but everybody we love wants tangents to on right now, bro. Oh, yeah, dude. We love tangents. Dude, dude, I'm so sick of the, the shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. There's well, not. What, what, can you can you help me out? Because I've been struggling with this. What is everybody's need for a shortcut? Yes. Knowing what you know about what it takes to get anything in life worth doing, what is the value of a shortcut? I think people think that they're going to do something right one time and make a lot of money off of it. And that's the appeal of like a shortcut is not having to work for anything and that everything's just going to fall in line that one particular time or something. They think they're special. And if they can just hit the shortcut, they're the one that the shortcut worked for. And now I'm special because I made it without having to go the full route. Here's the the thing about that. I've done that. It ain't ain't special. Everybody's done it. Everybody does it. So, um... I think it's the ability to, and me and Jim talked about this for a long time, is I have these moments of clarity that turned into creative things. And mix yoga was probably, you know, that thing where people constantly come up to me and go, I wish I thought of that. Yeah. You know, because when I get to where I'm going to get, I'll be the first person to have documented from day one to pro gate and have it all on film Uh that's the plan and that wasn't always the plan but you know after the last accident um you know i know we're we're back on that now but that was when i really screwed myself up that was a rough accident yeah i don't know how much you want to go into that because of you know we don't want to 
blow funny. anything on MX Yoga, but uh, I know you kind of yeah, tell true. that story over there. Uh, but yeah, that accident was definitely something that threw a wrench in all the gears that we were doing with MX Yoga and with. Uh, However, this is something actually I meant, I meant to bring up that kind of worked at the right time for your move to be able to get you over to Georgia. Cause and that's, had, that's what that's what the blessing was, was after that whole thing um, was I think it was several several. We've been talking about moving for a long time and pulling the trigger. And I woke up at two o'clock in the morning, just riddled in pain and. I was like in tears and I just, my wife's like, what's going on? What's going on? I'm like, I'm fine, but I'm not scared anymore. Uh And it's like the worst thing that had ever happened in my life physically, the most pain I'd ever been in my life, physically, mentally, just keeping, keeping your mind straight through that pain and being able to meditate through it and get through it. Um, but it was like, I'm not scared. Like, when you did this entire trying something new, it's not going to kill me. You know, I, I got to point this out too. That a lot of people don't know this, but I only know because I was right there with you through the whole thing. You went through this entire second accident, or your main accident, with no pain meds, right? You were using CBD right. only, you were using meditation, you were using proper diet and exercise. And going to your PT, ther- your physical therapist, they were saying, you're making leaps and bounds faster than we've any- seen anybody over here. Well, well, here's the thing. Like, um, when I broke my collarbone, um, I did the same thing. Um, I did the same thing. Um, CBD only. I remember I went to go to the doctor to get released for physical therapy. And the whole time, the doctor, they have this scripted um thing and i know it's scripted and it was trained because he said it the exact same way every single time (laughs) and it it was like i told him you know like you want pain meds and i'm like no pain meds are they're bad for your recovery your body's hurting for a reason okay so when you're taking and you're all ooped out um you decide hey i can walk over there i Mm -hmm. can play ping pong i can do whatever and then you overexert yourself um, and then you actually feel it through that. But by that point, you've created more damage. So the pain is a good thing. And that's, that's something I learned from a Navy SEAL. Um, the pain is a good thing. You can learn from the pain. It's when it, there's no pain mm. that you got to be worried about. So, you know, after all this traumatic things, it was just about managing, learning how to, number one, I didn't want to be oped out. It was, I remember being in the hospital and the doctor's trying to prescribe me oxy or whatever it was. And I told him, I don't want it. And he's like, well, what are you going to do? Um, I'm like, I'm probably just going to do CBD and THC. Uh, well, you know, medical association doesn't support the advocacy or use of yeah. CBD for recovery and blah, blah, blah. Everybody have the same script, mm-hmm. right? And I'm like, I don't care. It's I, I want to know what's going on. I'm raising a family. I'm trying to get back on my feet. I don't need to be checked out. I need to be aware, you yeah. know. So when I went back for that six-week checkup, he released to the physical therapist. And I told him, uh, I've been doing physical therapy for three weeks. And the day I in- was introduced to... The physical therapist, I passed the test for the physical therapist because I had the bike loaded up and I was headed to uh Kauia yep. to go ride. Yeah, you had a race I'm and you're like, like I'm hey, hoping to get released because I'm ready to go ride. That's right. I remember that. I remember that, dude. You were pumped. You were back on the bike within like three and a half weeks. That's dope, dude. And and um the funny part was I was so excited about getting back on the bike that I forgot my riding pants. So I had like these like champion, like basketball shorts. And I, I rode for two hours, a couple motos and bicycle shorts and O'Neal dude. I was like Ronnie Max 
Go ahead. I was just saying we we're about to wrap this up. We've we've hit our mark. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for being here with us. And and any of the, anything that he's been saying about this crash and about all the crashes, you can find out more on MX Yoga. So go watch and, that series. And besides MX Yoga, I mean. Is there anything uh, you want to shout out or is there a message? I mean, obviously the message is keep, get up there, stop, like stop getting in your own head over conquer what you want to conquer and don't let anyone yeah, stand in your I way. Think that's, right? generally the message. that's generally the message. If you want to go do something, go do it. Don't listen to people. They say, go do it. Um, if you want to do it, go do it. Don't be afraid to fail because really the fear of failure is kind of like this underlying that is a fear of success so you know unless you're pushing yourself to that breaking point you're never going to know how far you're going to be able to go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wise words from a wise man terry miller oh, everybody oh, hey dude thank you so much terry we appreciate you bro and we'll talk again um when the next project drops we'll we'll uh bullshit some more yeah, I think we may have a, a a feature project coming up soon, so I'll I'll keep Jim in the loop. Please do. As it becomes relevant, uh, we'll connect. I thank you guys for having me on. It was good connecting with you, Jim. Yeah, it's man, been, we'll uh, talk. We'll talk real soon. We'll we'll get back to it. it won't be so long, but between interactions next time. Uh, absolutely, man. Thanks, guys. All right, thank man. You, Take man. care, Terry. Awesome. Nice. Well, that was good. It's just great. You want to do the, like the outro? You can yeah, catch do. him at yoga at da 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 da. Uh, no, just do the Rat Nest outro. We'll be good. We got that still going. This has been the Rat Nest podcast. You can listen to us every week with new musicians, artists, illustrators, designers, movie engineers, um, probably some pet lovers, maybe a dog walker. And uh, yeah, YouTube for the video, ratnestpodcast.com coming soon. And all major platforms should be up in the next week or two. Sorry for slacking. Bye. And this has been Jim. I'm Jim. <laughs> <laughs>